Welcome to Wild Watch Out of Africa with me, Chris Packham. And what a start to the program. On the tip of my finger is a leopard. In fact, not one, but two in this tree behind me. Now, leopards are relatively common animals here in Africa, but they're notoriously difficult to see. So this is quite literally a once in a lifetime opportunity. Just look at that. But what else have we got coming up on this week's programme? Well, I'll be heading out after dark to see which creatures come out in the bush when the sun goes down. And I'll be meeting some animal orphans who have a very famous Hollywood dad, the real wild bunch. And we'll be spending a day in the life of the Maasai tribe. And I'll be sampling a, well, unique and definitely unorthodox breakfast dish. And there are 6.5 billion people on this planet at the moment, but I've got to tell you that today, without question, I am the luckiest one of them. But before I get too smug, let's take a look at this week's wild encounter where I get to meet another one of Africa's most dangerous animals, a bad-tempered root you certainly don't want to mess with. <laughs> Africa, and it's freezing cold. But then it is just after six in the morning, and I'm not complaining about getting up early because this morning is going to be terribly exciting. We're going out tracking rhino on foot. Now, as you know, these animals do have a foul temper, a bad reputation, and can be extremely dangerous. So I'm going to take the advice of our tracker, Dixon, and our driver, Anthony. Better give him a hand to get the vehicle ready. Now, these trekkers have got one of the most dangerous jobs in the whole of Africa. It's not only bad-tempered wild animals they have to keep a watchful eye on, they also have to deal with ruthless poachers who literally shoot to kill, and sometimes that even means people. Wow. Dixon, it's a massive place. Where do we start? Where do we start to look? We start where the, the, the rhino has put the dunks. So we come all the way out here to look for a dung heap? Yeah, we have to come all the way to look for the dung heap because it's the easiest way to get the rhino instead of patrolling the whole place. You like to start at the bottom? Yeah. And work up? <laughs> yeah. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> this is the midden. Oh, this is the midden. So maybe the rhino is just somewhere down here because even the footprints you see here, it's almost fresh. So we should go down this way, yeah? yeah? we should follow the footprints and then try to see if we can get him just close here. OK. A bit later, we're joined by two more armed rangers for added protection. We're very close to the rhinos now. The guy's just taken to a very thorny tree because we're in quite dense cover. The danger is, of course, that we'll come across them too quickly, too close. So you have to be extremely quiet. One of the eagle-eyed rangers has spotted a rhino in thick cover. We should go. Yeah, we go. And Dixon was determined to give me a closer look. We found the rhino, but unfortunately has found us. He's crossed our tracks and it can smell where we've been. So at the moment, He's coming right towards us. And obviously it's um, kind of important we don't let it get that close. So we're beating our tree. It's pretty exciting stuff. All of a sudden, the animal that's well known for its bad temper had a mood swing. And when this happens, it's not a good idea to be too close. Is he a male? Yeah, he's a male. He was after us. Yeah, he was after us. <laughs> and he would have charged us if he'd found us. Yeah. Because he is a quite big male. Yeah. yeah. And what's he doing now? Just listening, getting yeah, comfortable. He, yeah, you see, he's still comfortable, actually. When he's comfortable, he'll have to sleep. Now about 30 metres away from this rhino. It's actually dangerous even to speak in a low whisper like this. There's no question that being here in a very real sense of danger, because something spooks this out when it comes out, Pandemonium. The sleeping giant dozed his way through the heat of the midday sun, but our wild encounter wasn't over yet. Oh. 
After being in the bushes all morning and not getting really fantastic views, I mean, the rhino is now moving through some really sparse cover, even in the open. What an animal. His horns are immaculate. Typically in captivity, they rub them against any bars they have in their caging and damage them. But these are beautiful, long, smooth. But those horns can be the downfall of these rhinoceros because they're priceless. They're wanted in the Far East for use as an aphrodisiac. It doesn't even work, but nevertheless, in the last 25 years, the population of black rhinos has decreased by 90%. He doesn't know how lucky he is, but I know how lucky I am getting a fantastic view. Well, I just can't tell you, I just can't tell you, that was the wildest of all wild encounters. I'm not ashamed to say that when I was that close to the black rhino, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing on end. But you know, there's another one out here at the moment, although I'm at a very safe distance. Just look at that, what an absolute beauty. In the clear sunshine, you can see it extremely well. And just to its side, I can see another pair of ears, which probably mean that this is a female with its calf there down in the grass. Now, if you're after a wild encounter with a rhino or any other of the big five, but want to stay closer to home, then Marwell Zoo in Hampshire has the friendlier white variety. Longleat Safari Park in Wiltshire is renowned for their impressive pride of lions. And of course, there's Port Lim in Kent, whose elephants are truly superb. Now, you know, we're very lucky to be looking at these black rhino. They suffered terribly here from poaching in the past, but wildlife crime isn't confined to the African continent. It occurs all over the world. Only a couple of years ago, I went to a site in the New Forest where a pair of Montague's harriers needed guarding around the clock from egg thieves. Let's move on now to our safari special. It's my first night in Africa, and I can't tell you how excited I am. Now, the fact that it's night is not in any way an inconvenience, because when it gets dark, Africa really comes to life. Look at what I've just found. It's an absolutely monstrous beetle, a bit like one of our maybugs or cockchafers. But then the whole of the night is alive with insects. Just listen to it. Most of those noises you can hear are being produced by cicadas. But there's masses of moths buzzing around, and of course all of these insects means there's plenty of food for bats. OK, bats and bugs are all very well, but I wanted to see the larger creatures Africa has to offer. And the best way to do this was to join our ranger Dixon on a nocturnal safari. What are we likely to see tonight, Dixon? Uh, maybe... Uh... Seems maybe we might see lions or elephants, a lot of things. Mostly, I'll be very happy if we see Big Five. Big Five? Yeah. A buffalo particularly active at night, Dixon? Yeah, both because that's when the time they, it's very cold and they feed very nicely and when, that's the, when they come to the waterhole. Have you ever been charged by buffalo? Yeah, once we were charged, but uh, actually we managed to help ourselves. How did you escape? We, yeah, we just escaped and jumped over a tree, and then the tree broke down, and then we went, we went to another tree. <laughs> so these animals are quite dangerous. It sounds like a bit of a caper. Yeah. And there's some zebra here as yeah, well. Yeah, zebras. We have plenty of zebras in the game reserve. So mostly they graze at night because uh, you see always they're on move because they're so scared of lions. Yeah. So if something scared them here, they run almost two kilometers before they stop and try to see what was that. That's a spotted hyena, yeah? Yeah. A real scavenger. Old hyenas have got a terrible reputation. Do you think there's any truth in the fact that they would ever attack human beings? Yeah, yeah, sometimes they do attack. But that's when they are very hungry. Yeah. Or maybe if you look, get them somewhere where they can't help themselves, they just attack you directly. Oh, he's not going to attack us, he's no, this one heading, seems it, to... heading into the bush. Yeah. yeah.
jackals. They're a bit like our foxes. Yeah, actually, they're just like our foxes. Because you see, these ones, uh, mostly they, they get meat from uh, killed from lions and hyenas. They're scavenging. Yeah. But they also eat insects, don't they? Yeah, they do, but they do for the lions, whatever they go. And are they always around in pairs like this? Because I remember reading somewhere they mated for life. Yeah, they mated for life. It's quite romantic for, <laughs> for a jackal. <laughs> Well, that nocturnal safari was certainly a lot of fun, although I've got to say it was freezing cold and a, a bit dusty. But take a look at this, because that pair of jackals that we saw have been active in the daytime as well, with some rather grisly results. They've got a young impala, and already they've eaten the best part of the back half of it. It's really making pretty short work of that young impala. It's really cruel. Nature is cruel, there's no question of that. Well, we better leave this scene, I think. It's really not a great family viewing, is it? Now, just look at this. What an extraordinary spectacle. I can hardly contain myself. The best things in life are birds, and here are millions and millions and millions of pink ones. It's simply fantastic. Coming up over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be showing you more of Africa's biggest and boldest creatures, but also a few of the small and fascinating ones too. They'll be coming up in a moment, but have you ever heard of that nonsense about water going down the plug hole in the southern hemisphere in a different direction? Well, I've always been sceptical, so I thought I'd try a little experiment. Now today, I'm on my way to the William Holden Animal Orphanage. Now, William Holden, you'll remember, was an actor whose career spanned 40 years, but what you might not know is that he also had a very keen interest in African animal conservation. But en route, I thought I'd stop here at a point of geographical significance, latitude zero, the equator. And whilst you're here, the locals will conduct a rather interesting physical experiment. The Coriolis effect seems to be big business here in Kenya. Whenever you cross the equator, there's always someone ready to show you the experiment for a mere $10. What a bargain. And today, Patrick is our chosen scientist, and the test starts in our own northern hemisphere. It will only go clockwise. You know, this is a fact, and there's no way you can change it. No, no, this is probably a clockwise straw that you've got <laughs> No. It's a special <laughs> straw with magnets in or something. <laughs> right, come on, I've got to see it going anti-clockwise. <laughs> A quick 40 metre trip across the equator to the southern hemisphere. I just don't believe it. I'm <laughs> seeing it with my own eyes. It's going anti clockwise. You know what? The earlier you believe it, the better. You know, I thought this Coriolis effect was something they made up just to confuse you in O level physics. Come on then, I've got to see it on the equator now. <laughs> now, Patrick tells me there should be no rotation whatsoever. Let us apply our straw. Are you a believer now? I've seen it with my own eyes, but I'm, you know, I try not to be gullible with trickery. So what's the trick, Patrick? What is the trick? Come on. Is it the bowl? Is it the straw? No, is it this the... is not a trick, my man. Do you know what I think? I think all GCSE physics students should be brought to the equator on go a field trip. Ahead. That's what I think. Go ahead, bring them all. <laughs> Now this remarkable thing is not a real animal at all, it's a hybrid, and I bet you can guess between which two species. A horse and a zebra, and it's called a zebroid. I have to say, I'm not normally a horsey type of person, but these are extremely attractive. Just look at that beautiful pattern on their skin. They were used as pack animals, a bit like mules, because they're extremely hardy. Meet Speedy. Now, he came to Kenya in 1968, and at that time, like many other small kids, I had a pet tortoise at home. Only mine was only that big. But then when you're William Holden, an Oscar-winning actor, and you want a pet tortoise, you can think bigger. This is a Seychelles tortoise, so it's not indigenous to Kenya. But you know, old Speedy here is more than 100 years old. Just look at that tongue. It's a prehensile tongue that's used for pulling foliage off of branches, very similar to a giraffe. But then, of course, this is no giraffe. This is a unique opportunity to see an animal that you hardly would ever see, for two reasons. These bongo are strictly nocturnal, and also they're Africa's rarest antelope. Now, this wonderful animal is called a gareza, or a black and white colobus monkey. And colobus means mutilated. And if you look very carefully, you can see they only have four digits with a tiny thumb at the side. 
That's probably a very good adaptation for swinging around in the trees, and that's what these animals do. They're extremely arboreal. Now, as you know, the best things in life are birds. But you know what strikes me about this ostrich today is its unbird-like qualities. Just look at those legs. Look at its upright body and long neck. If ever I've seen one, this is a velociraptor. And of course, as you know, it's widely thought that birds evolved from dinosaurs. We'll be visiting another rehabilitation centre next week, but here's a question for you. Do you get fed up with the trials and tribulations of getting to work? You know, is the train late into Waterloo? Do you miss the Isle of Wight ferry? Do you get stuck in a traffic jam on the M25? Well, imagine that between you and work was one of these things. Just look at that lioness. They look pretty demure, pretty sober walking across the plain there, but let me tell you, they are awesomely powerful. And if this animal was standing between you and the office, the boss would be on the phone at five past nine to the recruitment agency. But you know, there's a whole tribe of people, the Maasai, that put up with these things on a daily basis. You see, for them, it's a wild life. It's just after seven o'clock in the morning and I'm here at this village on the top of the Masai Mara Plains in Kenya. I'm going to be spending a day with this extraordinary, well-known and noble tribe of African peoples. Julius and Moses are both wise men in training, which means that when their time comes, they'll offer guidance and wisdom to their community. And being the only two villagers that spoke English, they introduced me to their elders, who offered me a traditional morning meal. So, um, Moses, is, yep. is it time for breakfast now? Right. Yeah? What, what's on the menu? Uh, we have uh, blood and milk. Blood and milk, that's yeah. good. Toast? No, no toast, nothing. <laughs> okay, just blood and milk. Okay, yeah. well, yeah. let's knuckle down to breakfast then. Well, you can't get much fresher than this, but it's not only milk the cow contributes to breakfast, it's also blood. Now, this may look rather gruesome, but the animal always survives to tell the tale. It's much the same as you and I giving blood, and this cow will have at least six months to get over the ordeal. Uh, Julius, Moses, this must be a typical Maasai house. Um, right. How many yeah. people, Julius, would live in, in, in a house this size? This house is for one family. Uh, husband, wife, and the children. And the children. Yes. So five, six, maybe seven people. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> okay, yeah, you, you better yeah. test it first, Moses. Yeah, okay. 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 Give it a test. Good vintage? Mmm. Delicious. Is it? Mmm. Tasty? Oh. Yeah, very sort of um, like a very thick, meaty soup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't see him getting a franchise in a motorway service station for a new type of breakfast bar. It's just not going to catch on. After breakfast, it was time to head off to work with the Maasai, which meant a long, dusty walk in search of fresh grazing lands. So, Julius, what do, what do you do um, all day to protect the cattle? I mean, what about if there's a pride of lions here? You see the, 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 the man looking after, he's having a spear. Yeah? A spear for protection of the the cows when he sees any, any enemy. Any lions? Any lions. Are we likely to meet any lions today, do you think? Oh, yeah, there's a plenty of lions now. <laughs> now <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're yeah. teasing, I can yeah. tell. Yeah, No lions, thank goodness. Well, we've had a hot 
and windblown and now potentially rainy day out on the top of the plane here with the Maasai cattle mulling over all sorts of different things everything but football in fact which there was no apparent interest in it but now it sounds like there's a sing-song inside the village are we ready Julius yes. Julius, these are the young women in the tribe. Um, what are they singing about? The song all about is about uh, the praising of God for uh, giving, blessing them with the rain and also for blessing them to bear children. And they're praying for rain, and by the looks of it, yes. their wishes are coming true. Their wishes are coming soon. Because that, and that's good news, isn't it? Yes. Because of the, uh, of the drought. Yes. It's about ten past seven in the evening now, and the sun's long set over these high plains. I've had an extraordinary day with these people, learning a little bit about their culture. And there's one thing that strikes me. Not only is the environment in which they live extremely fragile and under a lot of threat from us, but then so is their lifestyle. And I sincerely hope that they manage to cope with Century 21 and live here, as they have done for thousands of years, in harmony with the wildlife. Well, sadly, that's all we've got time for on Wild Watch Out of Africa. But do join me again next time when I'll be meeting a rather boisterous lion cub, getting a view of the Maasai Mara from high in a hot air balloon, and also having a wild encounter with some crocodiles and some hippos. That is, of course, if we can get the Land Rover out of the mud. See you next time. I better, you know, better help out, otherwise they'll call me some sort of ponce or something. <laughs>